Today we're going to look at an integral that was suggested by a long-term problem suggester of this channel, and I'd like to thank that person now. And so we're going to explore, and notice that I'm not using the word evaluate here, we're going to explore the integral from 0 to 1 of natural log of x times the cosine of the natural log of x over x dx. And well, we're going to evaluate this or try to evaluate this using kind of a complicated method. And then, well, we're going to explore a simpler method as well. And the complicated method is using Feynman's trick, which is also called the Leibniz rule for differentiation under the integral sign. And so in order to do that, we need to define a function that kind of looks like this integral but has a new parameter. And well, we're going to call this i of t, and this is going to be equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of x to the t times the cosine of the natural log of x dx. And now, well, I'd like to make a quick observation, which you would learn in like a first semester differential calculus class. And that is if we take the derivative with respect to t of x to the t, well, in fact, what we're going to get is the natural log of x times x to the t. Okay, but that means that we can calculate i prime of t by this differentiation under the integral sign, and we'll get the integral from 0 to 1 of the natural log of x times x to the t times the cosine of the natural log of x dx. But observe that that means that our goal integral that we have written up here is in fact i prime uh, evaluated at negative 1. Because observe that's going to give us the integral from 0 to 1 of natural log of x times cosine of natural log of x all over x dx. So keeping that in mind, let's see if we can go right here and calculate our i of t integral. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, perhaps what I'll do is I'll take cosine and I'll rewrite the cosine function using our complex exponential. So let's see. We'll have i of t is equal to 1 half, and then we have our integral from 0 to 1 of x to the t, and then next e to the i times natural log of x plus e to the minus i times natural log of x dx. And well, what did I do here? Well, I simply used um, Euler's formula for the complex exponential. So e to the i theta is cos theta plus i sine theta. But by the evenness of cosine and the oddness of sine, that means that e to the minus i theta is cos theta minus i sine theta. And then, of course, we've got this nice system of equations. We can solve that for cosine theta, and we'll see that we get something that we just used in this last step. Okay, great. But now, let's observe that these are actually quite nice. This is x to the i power, and then this next term is x to the minus i power. Using logarithm rules, and then the fact that the natural log and the exponential function are well, they're inverse functions. So that means now we're going to have our integral from 0 to half of x to the t plus i um, plus x to the t minus i dx. And here, it's important to notice that t will be a real number here. So this is a real parameter. And you might say, well, why is that important to notice? Well, that's important to notice because now we can simply use the power rule to find the antiderivative of this function with respect to t. And perhaps if t was not a real number, then we could have a negative first exponent uh, for x, which means that we couldn't really use the power rule. Okay, so anyway, that's going to give us 1 half, 
And then we're going to have x to the t plus i plus 1 over, I'm going to write this as t plus 1 plus i, because now I've got it in our maybe uh, real part and imaginary part. t plus 1 is our real part, and then i is the imaginary part. And then here we've got something similar. So x to the t uh, minus i plus 1 over, let's see, this will be t plus 1 minus i. Then we have to evaluate that from x equals 0 to x equals 1. Notice that at x equals 0, it's 0. At x equals 1, those numerators become 1. That leaves us with 1 half. And then we've got, uh, let's see, 1 over t plus 1 uh, plus i plus 1 over t plus 1 minus i. And now we're going to simply give ourselves a common denominator to add these two together. The common denominator will be the product, but let's observe that the product of those two denominators is simply equal to t plus 1 squared and then plus 1. So that's going to give us 1 half, and then we have, like I said, t plus 1 quantity squared plus 1. And then, well, for the numerator, we'll have the sum of these denominators. That's how that'll work. So let's see, if we sum those denominators, we get 2 times t plus 1. And so, canceling some things out, what do we have? We have t plus 1 over, that's going to be t squared plus 2t plus 1. So let's maybe bring that down and notice that we have i of t is equal to, well, I'm just copying it down, t plus 1 over t squared plus 2t plus, oh, that should be a 2 there because the 1's double up. And then, well, we'll take that and remember that what we really want is the derivative of that with respect to t evaluated at negative 1. So let's see, i prime of t here is what? So we'll use the quotient rule. So we take the derivative of the numerator times the denominator. That'll be t squared plus 2t plus 2. And then from that, we subtract the numerator times the derivative of the denominator. So that's going to be t plus 1 times, well, that'll be 2t plus 2. 2t plus 2 all over t squared plus 2t plus 2 quantity squared. And then, well, there's just a bit of simplification that needs to be done there, but what I'll point out is if we plug in t equals minus 1, we get the number 1. So I'll maybe put up here that this seems like the final value for our integral should be equal to 1. But if we've done this in a complicated way, when you think that there should be a simpler way, well, you're right. There is a simpler way to explore this integral, and that's what we're going to do now. And we'll see that we might seem like we've entered into a contradiction, but in fact, well, we haven't, and we'll explain why. Okay, so now let's explore this using another method, and probably the method that jumps out at you is perhaps a u substitution. So let's see what we can make with a u substitution here. Perhaps we'll let u equal the natural log of x, because natural log of x is all over the place here. And then du will be equal to 1 over x dx, which has the added benefit of gobbling up this x in the denominator. Now, next up, let's observe that as x goes to 0 from above, which is what's happening in this integral, because our interval is from 0 to 1, then we have u approaching minus infinity. And then as x approaches 1, maybe from below, although that doesn't matter as much, we have u approaching 0. That's because the natural log of 1 is 0. Okay, so this is maybe all of the data we need for our u substitution setup. So let's see what that does to our integral. That's going to be the integral from minus infinity up to 0 of, well, in the end, it'll simply be u times cosine of u du. But whenever you've got something like this, which is now pretty obviously an indefinite integral, sorry, not an indefinite integral, an improper integral, you would set it up as a limit. 
Now observe over here, this always was an improper integral because we have a zero that gives us a zero in the denominator. So let's see, this should really be equal to the limit as I'll say a goes to zero of the integral from a, sorry, that should be a to minus infinity. And then the integral from a up to zero of u times cos u du. And now what we need to do is find the antiderivative of u times cosine u. And we're gonna use maybe the uh, internet's favorite method of integrating something like this, which is the di method, which is just a quick way of doing integration by parts. So what we'll do is we'll put the function over here on the left that becomes simpler as we differentiate it. That's always a nice rule is to pick the one that simplifies under differentiation to put in the differentiation column. So in this case, that'll be u. And then we'll put the other bit in the integral column, the antiderivative column really. Okay, so now let's take derivatives down this column. That'll give us one and zero. Antiderivatives here, that'll give us sine u and minus cosine u. Okay, nice. And then we're gonna match on the diagonal. Oh, sorry, the D doesn't match with anything. So U will match with sine and uh, one will match with negative cosine and then we alternate the signs. So that means we've got something like this. We have the limit as A approaches negative infinity of, so that's gonna be U times the sine of U and then minus the cosine of u evaluated from a up to zero. Now let's observe that evaluating it at zero, we'll get a zero for the sine contribution and a negative one for the cosine contribution. So that'll be minus one and then we'll have plus the limit as a goes to minus infinity. Really that should be a minus because now we're using the lower bound of integration of now this is gonna be a sine of a minus the cosine of a, so something like that. But now from here what we'll do, let's simply take this limit and explore it a couple of different ways. That'll be along a equals maybe minus n times pi. So now let's observe as n approaches infinity, a is approaching minus infinity, so this is one path towards minus infinity. And in this case, the green underlined limit is the limit as n goes to infinity of minus n times pi. And then we'll have the sine of minus n times pi, and then minus the cosine of minus n times pi. But now let's recall that the sine function at integer values of pi is always equal to zero. And I guess I should say here that n is taken to be an integer value of pi. And then, well, the cosine value alternates. So this is in fact equal to minus one to the nth power because cosine of an odd number times pi is negative one. Cosine of an even number times pi is positive one. But now, since minus one to the n continuously alternates as n is approaching infinity, notice right here, this limit in fact does not exist. Okay, well, that's actually enough to say that our original integral did not exist. But let's maybe do another example of this as well. So let's say we go along another path. Let's say the path that we go along now is something like this. Maybe it's pi over two minus two times n times pi. And now observe, we have the same kind of thing happening. As n is approaching infinity, a is approaching minus infinity. Now in this case, we're gonna end up with the limit as n approaches minus infinity of, well, this is gonna end up being pi halves minus 2n pi times the sine of pi halves minus 2n pi. And then nominally minus the cosine of that as well, but the cosine of half integer values of pi is zero. So that's actually gonna give us zero. 
And then next, let's notice that this sine value, because of the periodicity of sine, is always 1. And then this bit is charging off to minus infinity, meaning that this limit here looks like it's going to minus infinity. So that's another little piece of evidence that the answer should not be 1. And in fact, the fact that we got a different limit taking different paths to minus infinity means that this limit does not exist and, and thus the original integral did not exist. Okay, but really, what happened here? Why did our technique here not work? And, well, that's because we didn't satisfy the hypotheses of the theorem saying that we could take the derivative under the integral sign. And those hypotheses had to do with this function being continuous on this closed interval. And that's a good place to stop.